Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's July 21st. Today, we remember the creation of legislation that turned 778 acres of land into a beloved park in New York City. We'll also learn about the state flower of Maine. It's the only floral emblem that does not produce a blossom. And we salute the Swarthmore College alumni and horticulturist who created a magnificent garden at their home known as Todd Morden. And we also read some poems that celebrate the new habits that we cultivate in summer. We grow that garden library today with a book about authors and their gardens. I love this topic. And then we'll wrap things up with an old article about rose care during the heat of summer. But first, let's catch up on some greetings from gardeners from around the world in today's curated news. Well, today I'm going to kick things off by wishing my dad a happy 78th birthday. And since today is likely going to be a stormy, rainy day, We're going to celebrate the following day. We'll do something physically distanced up here at the cabin. But it'll be fun to show Dad what we're doing with the gardens here, the huge outdoor potting bench that we created. And you know, Mom and Dad especially love just hanging out on the front porch. So I think when they get here, I'll have some refreshments ready for them. And then they can just chill on the porch while I start weeding the front garden, which will be about 15 feet away from them. In any case, I'm looking forward to it. And I have to say, there's nothing I love more than a chat in the garden. Well, this week we welcomed new members, and they wrote back to share where they garden and what they like to grow. Lynn Dirk wrote, Good morning from Western North Dakota. I like to grow weeds because I'm really good at it. But um, she said, I'm in zone 4B, and it's especially challenging for Lynn because she spent years in a zone of Southern California. Can you imagine North Dakota after you've been in lovely Southern California? In any case, she wrote, this year I'm growing tons of tomatoes and assorted other veggies and lots of cutting flowers to brighten up the house during these hard times. And I love that. I love that idea. And then Mary Nagel Klein said, thank you for the warm welcome and for your wonderful podcast. It's my favorite listen when I'm doing my morning rounds out in the yard and in my gardens. And then she included a photo that she took in the morning of her house and garden in Minnetonka. And Mary's property is especially wonderful because she has four ancient oaks on her property. In fact, the picture she sent shows this beautiful stately oak. It's in a side garden on her property, and it supports the cutest little bench swing. And what a lovely way to welcome visitors to a home. And Mary truly appreciates what these oaks add to her property. She writes, The gardens and the landscaping are all designed around their stately presence. I think that's a very smart idea. Then Sam Ayala said, thank you for the welcome to the Facebook group. I garden as a hobby and as a relaxing ritual. He gardens in Zone 7 and he writes, I love hand watering and evolving the outdoor rooms that are the landscape. Well, I loved to hear that the garden is a place for calm and restoration for you, Sam. And I also love to hear that you hand water because that's a ritual that is often unappreciated and undervalued. But it's very good for you. And then when I wrote him back, since he's gardening in Zone 7, I said that as a northern gardener, I'll have to live vicariously through your pictures. Anyway, look forward to those. And then finally, Robin Smith Brannon is a new member, and she wrote that she gardens in hot and humid Zone 9 in Southeast Texas. She says, I've learned so much from this group and from Jennifer's podcast. I garden in a combination of raised beds and galvanized tanks. 
flowers are my jam. Well, when I replied to Robin, I said, I can never think about Texas without thinking of my friend and fellow garden blogger, Pam Pennick. In fact, I interviewed her on my old podcast called The Still Growing Podcast in episode 555, and we talked about her book, The Water Saving Garden. Now, Pam has a blog that's called Digging. So if you are in Texas, if you're in that very hot climate, you might want to check out her blog. She does a wonderful job. And if you'd like to hear my interview with Pam, just head on over to the Still Growing Podcast and search for episode 555, 555. And in fact, if I recall correctly, I believe Pam has a galvanized tank in her garden as well. Now, since Robin ended her introduction by saying flowers were her jam, I have to say that delighted me because I'm so glad that she appreciates the value of ornamentals as well as edibles. And as I shared with her, the old saying, the earth laughs in flowers, always makes me love them a little more. Well, that's it for today's Gardener Greetings. If you'd like to participate in the Gardener Greetings segment, just send your garden pics, stories, birthday wishes, and so forth to me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. That's jennifer at thedailygardener.org. And if you'd like to listen to the show while you're at home, you can always ask Alexa or Google to play the latest Daily Gardener podcast. And she will. Here's today's curated news. Today's article comes from a garden blog called Raven's Court Gardens, and they recently published a post called Heights Garden Club, hosting a successful tour during a pandemic, part one. Here's an excerpt. This June, we had the opportunity to do a garden tour in a large residential garden. We took several precautions, starting with using Sign Up Genius to take reservations in half-hour increments. And we extended tour hours from 1 to 2. We required everyone to check in, wear a mask, and use physical distancing while in the garden. Well, now, that's a very thoughtful approach to having a garden tour. And by the way, this post on Raven's Court Gardens was written by Lauren Lindsay. Now, if your garden club is contemplating having a garden tour, but they're just not sure where to start, or if your garden club already had a garden tour and you feel like there could be some lessons learned, Lindsay's post at Raven's Court Gardens is definitely worth a look. Now, if you check out this post, what you'll especially appreciate is all of her pictures, which really give you a sense of the very thoughtful details they put into this tour. There's wonderful signage that helps advertise their club. In fact, right now I'm seeing this beautiful sign. It says Heights Garden Club meets here. Beautiful. That's a best practice. And Lindsay also shared a map of all of the beds on this property, along with a complete listing of plants. Very well done. Now, if you do go ahead and check on this post, make sure you click through to see part two. You'll get to see beautiful pictures of this garden that was featured in part one. And this garden is really something else. There are these beautiful and very unique elevated pollinator gardens. They're quite something. There's also a magnificent pergola. And the pergola even has this little detail of having fish heads carved into the wood. This theme echoes the fact that this garden has a beautiful koi pond. And there are just so many wonderful little touches in this garden. There are license plate signs that have been transformed into art. There's a wine sign for the little patio area where you can imagine that they're relaxing at the end of a long day. The pond is just truly tremendous. And then there's so much whimsy in this garden. In any case, you'll have to check it out for yourself. And you can do that very easily by just heading over to the Facebook group for the show and typing the word tour 
into the search bar and this post will pop right up. All right, that's it for today's gardening news. Now, if you'd like to check out any of my curated news articles or blog posts for yourself, all you have to do is head on over to the free Facebook group for the show. It's the listener community. It's specifically designed for you, and it's 100% free. And the best part about it is that when you listen to the show and there's something that catches your attention, you can almost always find it in the group. There's no need to take notes or search for links. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. On this day in 1853, the legislation that created Central Park passed. Central Park was allowed 778 acres of land and was created by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox. The park was inspired by England's Birkenhead Park, which was created by Joseph Paxton. And there were a lot of wonderful firsts that happened in the construction of Central Park. Vox first coined the term landscape architect while working on the park. And Olmsted imagined a gathering place for all social classes, a place where everyone could come together and enjoy nature. And it was after Olmsted's work on Central Park that he became known as America's Park Maker. Now, as with any project, the development of Central Park hit some speed bumps. For instance, the American architect Richard Morris Hunt clashed with Olmsted and Vox over his design for one of the entrances to the park. And although Hunt had won a competition to design the southern entrance, Olmsted and Vox balked when they saw Hunt's plan. You see, Hunt had designed this very elaborate grand entrance, something he called the Gate of Peace. It included a circular fountain with a square parterre. But the most magnificent part of his plan was a semicircular terrace complete with a 50-foot column. At the base of the column, there was going to be a monument to Henry Hudson, and then the pool around it would feature Neptune in his chariot and Henry Hudson standing on the prow of a ship. Hunt really believed that the public would embrace his grand vision, and so he decided to promote his designs for the park all on his own. But he didn't appreciate Vox's power to squelch his idea. And although privately Vox said that Hunt's plans were splendid and striking, publicly he told a friend they were what the country had been fighting against— Napoleon III in disguise all over. Vox summarized that Hunt's designs were not American, but the park was. Well, ironically, in 1898, a memorial to Richard Morris Hunt was installed in Central Park. And it's located on the eastern perimeter. And it was created by the same man who created the monument to Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial, Daniel Chester French. Today, Central Park is also home to Strawberry Fields, a two and a half acre garden memorial dedicated to the memory of John Lennon. Yoko Ono and John Lennon used to enjoy strolls through that section of Central Park after they moved to the Dakota Building. After Lennon was shot, Ono came up with the idea for the memorial, and she said, It's our way of taking a sad song and making it better. Now, initially, the concept called for every nation to donate a remembrance tree to Strawberry Fields. But soon, Ono and the New York City Parks and Recreation Commission found themselves dealing with trees that couldn't grow in a northern climate. So they made a second request, send us some trees for strawberry fields. And when they sent that second request, they did something very smart. They sent along tips about what trees would survive in New York winters. 
Now that second request brought 150 specimens from countries around the world. For instance, England sent an English oak tree and Canada sent a maple tree. But there was one notable exception to the list of countries that sent trees, and it was the United States. Sadly, the Reagan White House never acknowledged the request. And in case you're wondering, the Strawberry Fields Memorial was made possible by a million-dollar donation from Yoko Ono to the city of New York. It didn't cost taxpayers a dime. And it was on this day in 1945 when the white pine cone and tassel was named the main state flower. So, Dad, if you're listening, that would have happened on your first birthday. And here's a little known fact about Maine's selection. Maine is the only state with a floral emblem that does not produce a blossom, the white pine cone and tassel. And I thought you would enjoy this little post from the New England farmer. They shared the story of how the white pine came to be the state flower this way. Mrs. Jane Dingley is the state chairman of the Maine Floral Emblem Society and said, although the apple blossom would make a fine appearance in a garland, It withers and falls the day it is born and can hardly represent the enduring nature of our state. Goldenrod is perhaps the most widespread of all Maine's flowers, but the petals are so fine it would make an indistinct blur in the hands of the engraver. The grand old pine, however, has none of these faults. It is green and beautiful in summer and winter. So there you go, Mrs. Jane Dingley making her case for the white pine. And as luck would have it, the Maine State Pomological Society also agreed with Jane, saying, we should select the pine as our floral emblem on account of its historical value. It was the pine tree that made our state. It was these great giants and monarchs of the forest that attracted the King of England to this country. In fact, he sent out his emissaries to select them for his mass. And of course, what they mean here is that England was using the white pines to help build their ships. And if you're confused by that term, monarch of the forest, listen to this. The eastern white pine is regarded as the largest conifer in the northeastern United States, and it's often referred to as the monarch of the north. So there you go. And today is the anniversary of the death of the heiress and horticulturist Edith Wilder Scott, who died on this day in 1960. Edith's story is one of my favorites. When Edith was a young woman, she met and fell in love with Arthur Scott at Swarthmore College. Arthur, by the way, invented the throwaway paper towel, and he was the heir of the Scott Paper Company. After their wedding, the young couple toured New Zealand on a year-long honeymoon. In the early 1900s, Arthur and Edith bought an old ramshackle country club in Rose Valley, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia, and they turned it into their home. They christened their new place Todmorden Farm, and today it's on the National Register of Historic Places. Both Edith and Arthur loved horticulture, and they surrounded Todd Morden with gardens. Together, they had a special love for lilacs, iris, peonies, and rhododendrons. In fact, Arthur helped found the American Peony Society and was an active member of the American Iris Society. Arthur believed that if a person was interested in horticulture and loved flowers, then he had to be a good man. Well, like her husband Arthur, Edith hybridized many of the plants on their property, which resulted in many awards and medals for her. 
For her success with horticulture, Edith became a distinguished daughter of Pennsylvania in 1950, and she was also bestowed with an honorary degree by Swarthmore College. In 1929, after Arthur died, Edith worked to establish the Scott Arboretum at Swarthmore College in her husband's honor. The Arboretum director, Claire Sawyers, said that Edith wanted the Arboretum to display ornamental plants that plant lovers could study and learn from. Today, the Arboretum contains several plant specimens named for the Scots, and it also specializes in teaching horticulture by visual demonstration, one of the best ways to learn. And check this out. There's one final side note about Arthur Scott that is particularly relevant today. His reason for inventing the paper towel, which was featured in his obituary. Here's what it said. In the early 1900s, there was a severe flu epidemic in Philadelphia. Arthur heard that a teacher had cut paper for her students to blow their noses on so he invented a throwaway paper towel. This story was told to the family by Arthur's daughter, and the resulting invention is supported by his patent application, U.S. number 1141495 of November 10, 1910. And the patent application actually had some notes from Arthur. It said, My object is to embody in the towel cleanliness and antiseptic qualities, coupled with such cheapness that the towel may be destroyed after use. The towels are preferably formed in rolls, so that only one towel at a time may be exposed and detached. The roll form acts to protect the unused towels from absorbing moisture and gases from the atmosphere. And that's how the paper towel came to be first marketed as a medical device for sanitation purposes. In Unearthed Words, here are some thoughts about the new habits that we cultivate in the summer. This first one's from the American author and professor Sam Keen. Deep summer is when laziness finds respectability. And here's a poem from the Scottish novelist and writer Robert Louis Stevenson. It's called Bed in Summer. In winter I get up at night and dress by yellow candlelight. In summer, quite the other way, I have to go to bed by day. I have to go to bed and see the birds still hopping on the tree or hear the grown-up people's feet still going past me in the street. And does it not seem hard to you when all the sky is clear and blue, and I should like so much to play, to have to go to bed by day? It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Philosophy in the Garden by Damon Young. Ugh, it's one of my favorites. This book came out in April of 2020, and it explores the relationships between authors and their gardens, one of my favorite topics. The Daily Telegraph said, This is a gardening book that takes readers not on a walk around great estates, but on a tour of great minds. It's a lovely extension on the notion that gardens make you contemplative. And in working with the soil, you see life's big picture. So good. This book is 208 pages of authors and their gardens, and it answers all kinds of questions. For instance, why did Marcel Proust have bonsai beside his bed? Or what was Jane Austen doing coveting an apricot? Finally, how was Frederick Nietzsche inspired by his thought tree? You can get a copy of Philosophy in the Garden by Damon Young and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $11.
Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today in 1951, the Lancaster-era newspaper out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, reported on rose care during the heat of the summer. It said this, Hot summer weather is not a serious problem to healthy rose plants as long as a regular schedule of care is followed. Giving roses an adequate water supply is probably the prime responsibility during these hot, dry periods, and a plentiful supply of water is important to keep up the blooming rate and growth and to build energy, which will mean better plants next year. Now, the best method is to let the hose slowly trickle over a board at the base of the plants. An important thing to remember is to avoid wetting the foliage of rose plants when watering the beds, since this practice often contributes to the spread of fungus diseases. Naturally, a good damp soil attracts weeds, but these unwelcome guests may be discouraged by mulching with composted grass clippings, buckwheat hulls, ground corn cobs, or other available material. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Bierbaum, Kiana Rayleigh, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.